Well, good morning, everybody. Doing all right today on Easter Sunday? You look quite sunny this morning considering how rainy it is outside, so we want to congratulate everybody for, you know, really braving these terrible California conditions. When it rains like this, we just don't know what to do with ourselves. So thank you all very much. We're thrilled you're here this morning. My name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at The Bridge. And so if you are new today, let me just add my welcome and say thank you very, very much for being in the house. It means so much to us that you would choose to be with us on Easter Sunday. Thanks again for being here today. And listen, for everybody that calls The Bridge home, if you're here on a regular basis, you are probably not accustomed to seeing me sit down like this and quickly moving from side to side. You're wondering why I appear to be operating with only one functional leg. Let's just say I fought the stairs and the stairs won to the tune of a broken fibula this past week. So, yeah, I hear everybody go. (laughs) But you know what? I I gotta say this this morning. We've had such a fantastic morning in the house of God. It doesn't matter if you've had a really great week, if you had a tougher week like I did. Maybe you had a pretty challenging week with whatever kind of situation came your way. Maybe you even had a tragic week this week. Can I tell you this morning, we have reason to celebrate because Jesus Christ is alive and well. And we have new life because of him. And I have the great privilege of getting to bring the Easter message to you today. So if you've got your Bible, meet me in Matthew chapter, excuse me, Luke chapter 24. I almost told you to go to the wrong place. Luke chapter 24. And we're going to look at one of the gospel accounts of the resurrection and what happens at the discovery of the resurrection. And you know, when you look through the various gospel accounts, all four of them, we see the story told a little bit differently. There's some consistencies. There's some things that are different from story to story, from account to account. But this specific story from Luke 24 is one that I just could not get away from over the last few days. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I read my Bible, it's like God just points his finger on something and says, hey, stay here, look at this, read that again. And I like it when he does that. Sometimes it challenges me right where I'm at, and sometimes he helps me when I communicate. But can I just say this morning, I believe that the Lord wants to speak to us from this passage about the resurrection. And Before we read through this account of the discovery of the resurrection of Jesus, I want to ask everybody in the house a bit of a funny question. But nonetheless, I want you to consider it this morning right there in your own personal life. And the question is simply this. What did you bring with you to church today? What did you bring today on Easter Sunday? When you came to church this morning, what did you bring with you? I know that some of the ladies, you're looking around, you're like, well, my my purse is here. Ladies, if you're anything like my wife, you've probably got your purse, a Stanley cup, a coffee cup, a tea cup, another cup for snacks, maybe another cup or two for your kids' snacks or drinks. That's kind of what things tend to look like for us, but that's not what I'm talking about. Guys, you're probably thinking, yeah, this is that point in the service where he wants to know if I brought my wallet. Don't worry, be our guest. We're glad that you're here today on Easter Sunday. But not in a tangible, practical sense, more in a spiritual sense. Let me ask it one more time. What did you bring with you today? What did you bring with you when you came to church this morning? Let's read from Luke 24, starting in verse 1, the account of the discovery of the empty tomb. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them. This is speaking to a group of women who would have accompanied a man named Joseph. Scripture tells us in Luke 23 that Joseph was from a town called Arimathea. He was a wealthy man, a rich man. He owned his own tomb or grave, and he's apparently donated it to Jesus. So after Jesus has been taken down from the cross on Friday, now Joseph brings him down and he donates this tomb. And Scripture says that there are women that accompany Joseph to Christ's burial. And now some of those women are with these other women in Luke 24. So again, it says that some of these women came together with them, and they came to the tomb bringing the spices. Notice these words. They were bringing the spices which they had prepared. But when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away, and it was away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men, or so they thought were men, stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? For he is not here, but he is risen. 
Remember how he spoke to you when you were still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. But then, on the third day, rise again. Verse 8 says, And they remembered the words of Jesus. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven. This is speaking to the remaining eleven disciples or apostles. They told these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And finally, in verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much for everything that this day means to us. We've already worshiped and praised the name of Jesus, and we've honored the name of Jesus for everything that it means to us today. But I pray that the power of the resurrection would come alive in our lives and in our hearts today as we meditate and think on everything that was accomplished at the cross in the tomb. And today as we think about these things, I pray that that very same power that raised Christ from the dead would be awakened in us in a new way and we would recognize that Jesus, you have called us to so much more and we would see everything you've made available to us. Speak to every single person represented in this house today and within the sound of my voice in Jesus name and everybody said amen. amen. You know when we read the story of the resurrection of Jesus, it's really, really easy because we read Scripture in hindsight. For those of us who already know the end of the story, it's really, really easy for us to overlook the sorrow that was in the hearts of these women that Scripture talks about who approached the tomb after the death of Jesus. And each gospel account paints a picture of women coming to the tomb, but they don't approach the tomb with joy. Instead, they approach the tomb with sorrow and with grief and with loss in their heart, with heartbreak really, as a part of their condition. And it's so important that when we see this, that we comprehend the joy of the announcement that Jesus was alive by first looking and appreciating the sorrow that was attached to his death. And it's important this morning to also remind ourselves that without the cross, the empty tomb loses its power. And without the, the, the empty tomb, the cross loses its purpose. You see, these two things were meant by God to go hand in hand. You can't have the cross without the empty tomb, and you can't have the empty tomb without the cross. And while today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the best way to enjoy it is by first considering the sorrow that was attached to the cross. And see, today when we come to church on Easter Sunday morning, we aren't just attending a service. What we're really doing is we're returning to the scene of the story. We're going back to the place where all of it happened. And we must understand that before there was joy, there was mourning. Before there was celebration, there was sorrow. And before there was life, of course, there was death. When you read through this passage slowly, what you see in the first verse of Luke 24, is that this group of women arrives at Jesus' grave and they brought something with them. Scripture tells us that they brought spices, but they didn't just bring spices. It actually goes on to say they were spices that they had prepared, things that they had spent time in preparing so that they could bring them to the tomb. And with these spices, they intended to apply them to the body of Christ and to, in, in, in all reality, what it would do by bringing these spices and applying them to the body, I hate to be crass, but really it would drive away the stench that was about to set in to the dead body of Jesus. When they arrived, they anticipated that they would have access to enter the grave and anoint Jesus' body with their spices. And by emphasizing this, this, the spices and the herbs, if you will, that these women brought to the grave, really the reason this is, is uh, significant is because this simple act shows us that what they brought to the grave that day was a reflection of what they believed they would receive from Jesus that day. In other words, the spices were a reflection that they believed that death had the final word after Jesus had gone to the cross. They were not expecting a resurrection when they came to the tomb that day. In fact, you read on in the passage and it says quite clearly that the angel had to remind them, don't you remember the words of Jesus? He said that he must die and then three days later be raised from the dead. And upon the angels telling them that, they remembered his words. But they had to be reminded because that day when they arrived at the tomb, they showed up not with joy, they showed up with sorrow. And the spices that they brought, again, were a reflection of what they were expecting. They expected 
death to have the final word. And I want you to imagine for a moment these women on Friday afternoon and then later Saturday night after they had honored the Sabbath day, they honored the dead body of Christ. That was their plan by bringing these spices. And they're offering a statement that hope was lost, that death had won, and that the grave would be Jesus' final resting place. They expected nothing more. And what they brought, again, was a reflection of what they believed or expected from Jesus. I want to say this to every person in the house, that today in our gathering, we return to the tomb. We return to the place where everything changed, and we return to the scene of the story. And like these women, every single one of us, all of us in this room today, everybody watching online, everybody that's watching in the additional seating in the youth center, every single one of us come here today bringing something with us. I don't think anybody here today brought spices and herbs with you to anoint the buried body of Christ, but certainly all of us brought something, whether it's our life experiences, our expectations of this day, our expectations in our life. Maybe it's things that even happened this morning that we bring with us as a bit of baggage as we come to the tomb today on Easter Sunday. And I'm going to ask you this question one more time personally to consider. What is it that you brought with you when you came into the house today? Now, there's a whole long list of things that each of us could probably name that we brought with us. Maybe you came in today happy. Maybe you came in today sad. Maybe your life is surrounded by circumstances. Or maybe you feel like everything is going fantastic. No matter what it is, all of us brought something with us. And I just want to consider a few things if we can this morning. Let's just start with the most positive thing that anything that any one of us could have brought with us today. I think the most positive thing that any one of us could have brought to this day, Easter Sunday, where we reflect upon the tomb of Christ, the most positive thing we could have brought was a living, active relationship with Jesus Christ because of what God did for us at the cross and the empty tomb. And I know that this is a house full of people that at some point in their life have made a decision. Jesus, your cross represents forgiveness for my life. Your empty tomb represents the new life I could not have acquired my, in my own strength. So today I choose this relationship. I choose to follow you. I want you to be alive and active inside of me. And today, because of what Jesus did at some point in your past, you are walking forward in a healthy relationship with the one true living God. It's the best thing any of us could have brought when we came into the house today, but can we just be honest? I know a lot of us didn't exactly bring all positive things with us when we came into the house today. A lot of us brought our baggage. We brought our stuff, we brought our past, our regrets, our shame, our sin, our condition, our experiences, whatever it might be that you, worked, that you went through this morning. We bring all of those things with us when we come to the tomb today. And let me just give you one example of something that's very common that all of us, maybe at one point in our life or another, will bring with us when we come to the tomb. Maybe today you brought with you religiousness or more specifically, ritualism. Maybe you came here today out of obligation. You didn't come here by choice. You came here because it's Easter and this is what you're supposed to do on Easter Sunday. You see, ritualism says, yes, it's Easter Sunday, so in order to check all the boxes, or what about this? Maybe this will kind of hit home with you today. In order to make mom happy, in order to make dad happy, maybe to make grandma and grandpa happy or your spouse happy, maybe in order to satisfy your friend or your neighbor or your coworker that kept inviting you and inviting you and inviting you to be in church today, you're here just to get them off of your back. Or maybe you're here today because what about this? because you feel like it's your obligation in order to keep God happy with you to be in church on Easter Sunday. When we settle for ritualism, we keep Christ at a distance and we say, I'm good, not realizing that we've deprived ourselves of the greatest relationship that's ever been extended to us. And see, sadly for many of us, we call ourselves Christians, but we fall into this trap of religiousness or religiosity and ritualism, and we treat God like a list of boxes that we have to check in order to keep him happy. And I want to say to every person in the house this morning that if you're here out of obligation or religiousness or ritualism, Jesus Christ died and rose again to give you something a whole lot better than religiosity and ritual. He died to give you a pure and authentic relationship with the one true living God. 
And even if that's the reason you came here today, I want to tell you I'm grateful that you're in the house today. Here at Bridge Church, we don't beat up people that show up at Christmas and Easter. We will open these doors for you every single time that you want to step foot in this house. And we're grateful that you're here today. But I want to tell you something. If, you're, if you call yourself a Christian, God has so much more than just checking boxes and walking through religious ritualism. He wants to offer you a relationship through Jesus with himself. You know, when we find ourselves walking through a season of ritualism or maybe even religiousness, we can often find ourselves in this place where what we begin to do is we start to make up our own moral code. We have this idea in our mind that we can create our own self-righteousness that can keep God happy. And if I show up for church on occasion, everything's good between me and God. But what we find is that becomes a trap because suddenly we're living according to our own code of righteousness, which always falls short of the true God of righteousness. And I want to say to everybody this morning that when the prophet Isaiah looked ahead, to Christ coming, he didn't just talk specifically about Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection, but he actually looked ahead and understood that we could not save ourselves by trying to create our own standard of righteousness. It says in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, but we are all an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, notice these words, are like filthy rags. When you see that word righteousness right there, it's actually pearl. It says righteousness is. In other words, we can so often try to create our own standard of righteousness, our own standard of morality, living life according to our own rules. And every time we start to see ourselves as being okay in the sight of God according to our own rules, God looks down and he sees our own self-righteousness like filthy rags. It doesn't add up. It doesn't measure up to his standards. It goes on and it says, we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And I want to encourage every single person in the house today, don't come to the tomb and settle for ritualism that tells you I'm good enough for God in my own self-righteousness. Take a step closer and consider the price that's been paid for your redemption. Because if we will enter in and take a step closer to the tomb, what we'll find out is that God wants to do something supernatural on the inside. And the picture that I see in my heart when we find ourselves walking through a pattern of ritualism or religiosity, it's as if we're stepping up to the tomb and we're keeping what Jesus did at a distance and saying, I see it, I notice it, I observe it, but I'm not going to come any closer. I'm good right where I'm at. Don't settle for the place that you are today, my friend, because God has something a whole lot better. And it all starts with seeing what Jesus did for you inside that empty tomb. Amen? Amen. Maybe you hear this morning in ritualism, yeah, that hits home. You're like, Zach, I feel like I'm just going through the motions today. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you find yourself in another place today. Maybe this is a word that will ring more true today in your life, and it's the word rebellion. I know that's a bit of a harsh word, and sometimes it can sound kind of accusational or even confrontational. When we talk about rebellion, you're saying, Zach, are you saying that I've rebelled against God? What's funny about it is that Scripture tells us that God has placed eternity inside each one of our hearts, and somehow when we come into his presence, we can figure out very, very quickly whether or not we are in right standing with him. Something amazing happens when we step into his presence and we see where we are, where we stand with God. You see, our rebellion says, yeah, I see everything that God has provided for me, but I think I can make a better life on my own. Sometimes rebellion doesn't look like unbelief or even outright a rejection of God. It can often mean accepting what Christ has done for me, accepting his benefits and accepting his blessings, but rejecting his lordship over my life. What's interesting about this is that I am the first one to put myself in line and say that I've walked through my season of life where I rebelled against God. I wanted his blessing and I wanted his benefits, but I did not want to surrender to the lordship of Jesus in my life. And when I found myself there, my life looked a whole lot like a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15. Many of you might know this story well. It starts out in scripture by telling us the story of a lost son, but maybe you know it better as the story of the prodigal son. Jesus said there was a son. He was the younger of two sons. He had a rich father, and this rich father had worked so hard to give his son so many amazing benefits and blessings. But one day, the younger son comes to his father, and he says, Dad, it's been nice living in your house, but I'm ready to step out on my own. I want my inheritance now. I want to go off and live life my way. I don't want the life that you want for me. I want my life on my terms, but I want your blessing and your benefits. 
And this father in his graciousness looked at his son and said, okay, that's fine. I'll give you what's coming to you. Go ahead. Go make life for yourself the way that you want it. And what we see very soon is that the son runs off and he begins to squander everything that the father worked so hard to provide for him. Until pretty soon he's burned sinfully through all of the money his father gave him. He's hungry. He has no means in order to purchase a meal for himself. And he finds himself out working on a farm. And he's feeding pigs. And as he looks down and sees the pods that the pigs are eating, he recognizes that the pigs have more food to eat than he does. And he realizes the terrible condition he's in until one day he says, it's time for me to go home, except my father's never going to accept me. He's never going to see me as his son again because I've squandered everything he provided for me. And so reluctantly he begins to rehearse this speech and he realizes if I can just go home and not even be a son, simply be a servant, at least my father's servants have three square meals a day. At least I'll get to eat again. And he's reluctant to go home until he just starts that journey home realizing it's his only opportunity. And when he gets back home, what he finds is that his father is actually outside waiting for him. And I imagine that day in the story of the prodigal son that as the son got closer and he rehearsed his speech, trying to figure out how he was going to earn his way back into his father's good graces, what scripture tells us is that the father was waiting on him to come home. And he didn't just wait for him, but when he arrived, he killed the fatted calf. He threw a party. He put his robe around his shoulder. He put his ring on his finger, and he welcomed him back into the family. And I imagine that day that the prodigal son, thinking that he couldn't earn his way back in, quickly found out that the price had already been paid for him to be redeemed back into the family. And I want to say to everybody in the house this morning that no matter how far you might feel from God, you might feel like you have to earn your way back home and God might not ever accept you back. But what you need to know is there is no price that needs to be paid now because the price has already been paid once and for all and God is simply waiting for prodigal sons and daughters to come back into the family today and welcome you home. When we use that word rebellion, it's a bit of a strong word. But the reality is I identify with it because I've been there. I've been that person that looked at God and said, God, I want all your blessings. I want all your benefits, but I want them on my terms. Until the time came that I reached the end of my road. And you might hear that and say, Zach, that, that makes sense to me. I get it. Or maybe you're a little bit reluctant yourself to admit that that's where you're at today if you're feeling far from God. But let me show you something. Isaiah 53 in verse 6. We read this on Friday night, on Good Friday. This is what it says. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everybody say all. all. We've all done it. We've all rebelled. We've all gone our, gone our own way. We've all gone off and tried to make a better life for ourselves than what God wanted to provide for us. Like sheep, we've gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. But look at this. In spite of my sin, in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my failures, when all of my sins deserve to be put on me and I go to the cross that Jesus went to, what does it say? And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. If you're here today and you fear, feel far from God and you feel like that price can't be paid, you need to be reminded today that Jesus has taken my sin and he's taken your sin on the cross and you and I cannot afford to pay the price, but the good news is that he's already paid it so that we can come back into the family of God. But we have to be the ones to admit, God, I'm far from you. Maybe at some point in your past you made that decision and you said, God, I want to walk with you, I want to know you. I want your blessings and I want your benefits, but you, like me, have gone astray. You need to know that God's not waiting harshly to judge you and condemn you. He's waiting out front with his arms wide open, ready to welcome you back into his family. Amen. And there's going to be a big party in heaven if you're willing to do that today, in Jesus' name. For each and every one of us, if we'll stay, take a step closer to the tomb today, we'll see that God wants nothing more than to show us everything that he's made available through the resurrection of Jesus. So we talked about religiousness. We talked about ritualism. We even talked about rebellion. But maybe as we mentioned those words, you'd say, Zach, those aren't the words for me. Zach, I'm in a relationship with God, but if I'm honest, when I walked into the doors of this place today, when I come to the tomb, I got a heavy heart because I'm dealing with some stuff in my own life. Maybe your life has been surrounded by tragedy over the last few days. Maybe your life has been surrounded by circumstances over the last few days. Maybe there's difficulty that you're dealing with right now that seems so much bigger than you. 
And it's not religiousness or ritualism. And it's not rebellion that's concerning you today. Maybe when you walk through the doors of this place, the thing that you need the most is you just need some relief. Maybe your circumstances feel really big and you feel really small. Maybe your questions feel many and your answers feel few. Maybe what you're walking through right now has got you so weary and so burdened that when you walk through the doors of this place today, the thing you need more than anything else is rest and relief. Today I'm reminded of a family that's connected to our church that just a few days ago they lost a wife and a young mother in her early 30s to a late stage diagnosis. And today as they approach the tomb, relief is the cry of their heart. Rest is the cry of their heart. I think of another family in our church who recently lost their mom and grandmother. And after multiple weeks of travel and sickness and hospitalizations, they approached the tomb today just looking for rest and looking for relief. I think about a single mom who just this week I spoke to and she told me the story of her 11-year-old son that she hasn't seen in months. And as she told me that story, she talked about the broken relationship. And she said, would you please pray for me? Because all I want is some rest and relief from this situation. I just want to see my son again. I think about parents and grandparents in our church who come up to us and say, Pastor, will you pray for reconciliation in my family? Because the relationship with my kids and my grandkids has become broken and strained. They say, we just want to see our kids come back into faith. We just want to see our kids come back into relationship with us. Or even more specifically, we just want to have a relationship with our grandkids again. And I hear these stories and I recognize that there are certainly people that are in this house today that when you come to church on Easter Sunday and you approach the tomb, you approach that place where new life is supposed to spring out of, what you find yourself crying out for above all else is rest and relief. But the good news is that Jesus has offered that to us also. And I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 11, the very words of Jesus. And I want to read these from the message paraphrase today because I think it's going to hit home a little bit differently. And I want to ask every single person in the house who's feeling weary and worn out and tired and overwhelmed by the circumstances of life to tune in and hear the words of Jesus for your situation. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And see, for most of us, what we tend to, to do is to run all the wrong places to find the rest and the relief that only God can give us. Jesus said before he went and ascended into heaven, he said, my peace I leave with you. And it's not as the world gives peace, but it's a supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace so great it doesn't make sense. And the only way we can access it is by following the instructions of Jesus when he said, come to me. And I want to invite every single person in the house, wherever you are and whatever you've brought with you today, to take a step closer to the tomb and find the rest that Christ is offering. We saw those words of Jesus where he says, come to me, come to me. The traditional translations say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I don't think it's a coincidence the way that reads with the way the story plays out here in Luke chapter 24 when we see these women getting the news of the resurrection. Because verse 3 of Luke 24 tells us that when the women came to the tomb and they found that the stone was rolled away, there are three incredibly significant words that pop up that we might read right past. It says that when they saw that the stone was rolled away, they went in. And I know that those words might not sound significant as we read through that verse, but I gotta be honest with you. As a pastor who's done a lot of memorial services and a lot of funerals, I've stood at the head of open caskets at viewings as family and loved ones came in to take a look at their loved one who was laying there lifeless. I'll be the first one to tell you that I do not like standing next to a casket that is open when somebody dead is laying in it next to me. I don't much care for going to funerals. I don't much care for going to gravesides. And the biggest reason why is because it makes me stop and ponder death. And it makes me stop and ponder my own mortality. 
And the thing about the, the tomb, when we come to the tomb on Easter Sunday, is the exact same thing happens when we have to ponder the death of Christ, but even more specifically, we have to ponder the fragility of our own life and our own mortality. And if you're here today and you think about the tomb the way that I do, if I was one of these women who walked up to the tomb that day with my spices and I saw that the stone had been rolled away, let me tell you, I would have been really reluctant to walk in and look at what was laying there. Because they had seen what happened to Jesus on the cross. They had seen him be beaten. They had seen him be tortured. They had seen him die. They had seen that spear pierced into his side when fluid ran out the side of his body. And they saw him be pulled off that cross and be wrapped and then put into that tomb. They saw every bit of it. They knew the ugliness that was inside that tomb. Yet it says that when the stone was rolled away and they came upon it, they went in. And today, maybe the religiosity, the ritualism that you brought with you is making you keep the tomb at a distance. Can I tell you something? If you're willing to step out in faith and in boldness, there's something supernatural inside that tomb that will set you free and change your life forevermore. And if you came into this house this morning feeling a little bit rebellious and far from God, recognizing that you've tried to do life in your own way, can I tell you something? If you will be bold enough and have enough faith and courage to step into the tomb, you'll find that God will meet you right where you're at with a supernatural message that will take you forward into everything that he has for you. And if you came into this place needing rest and needing relief, the good news is, is that death did not have the final word. If you'll step inside the tomb, you'll find the life that God wants to give you available to you this very day. I imagine that day, if I could just use some of my own words, because this isn't what the Bible says, this is what I'm saying. But I imagine that day, if there was a further conversation between those two angels and those women, I imagine they stepped into that tomb holding those spices that they had prepared those spices that would quench the stench of death that was inside of that tomb. A lot of us bring all kinds of things with us in life trying to quench the stench of death that often surrounds us. But I imagine as those women walked in holding the spices they had prepared that the angels probably looked at those women and said, hey, and before you go, those spices you brought, you can lay them down because you don't need them anymore. There's no dead man inside of this tomb. He's alive, he's well, and he's making new life available to you. And I want to tell you today that whatever you brought with you today, you don't have to walk out with. You can leave it here because God's got something better. You don't need ritualism. You don't need religion. You can have an authentic relationship with God. You don't need rebellion. You can be restored back into the family. And if you need rest, there is no better place to find it. Leave what you brought and leave with something better today. We can't understand joy unless we first consider sorrow. We have to consider the pain before we can celebrate. But the beauty of the story of the tomb is that new life has sprung out of death and God has made available that life to all of us. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you so much for everything that this day represents. We re represent today the, the, the resurrection of Christ the new life that we have, the life eternal, the relationship that's available to us, that's what's represented in this gathering today as we've come to the tomb. But Father, it's our choice to step in. It's our choice to come to you. And today we choose to walk in, to step in and receive everything you've made available to us. Jesus, we believe that you are the son of God and we believe that you died for us and we believe that you were raised to life so that we could enter into that new life as well. So today we choose all of that. God, we give you our worship. We give you our praise. We give you our adoration. Thank you that what we brought with us today doesn't have to go with us when we leave. We can leave it here. And we can step into all the better things that you've made available to us. So we receive those things. God, we choose to praise you for what you've done and receive everything that is available to us. In Jesus' name, amen.